Have you ever wondered why a Spitfire had those elliptical wings? And also, why do gliders have such long, thin wings? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to the sixth class in the Principles of Flight series. Today we're looking at the ways in which wings are designed, also how we name them and the methods used for creating a nice and efficient wing. This class is a combination of lift, drag and vortices and how to combine them to create a very efficient wing. So a good understanding of all three of those concepts is essential for understanding how a wing is designed. So now we know about lift, drag and vortices it's time to combine them together and figure out why wings are designed the way they are. First of all, we'll talk about some basic definitions. We've mentioned some of them before, so hopefully you have an idea of some of them as we go forward. So first of all, this part of the wing is called the wing tip and the part attached to the fuselage is known as the wing root. The distance between both wing tips is known as the span, or the wingspan. The wing area is the area covered by the wings and also this middle part of the fuselage between them. So your wing area is this space in here. The taper of a wing is this property of it narrowing towards the tip because the cord length is shorter at the tip than it is at the root. From the taper, we can devise a taper ratio, which is the ratio of the cord tip to the cord root, how much it narrows. The sweep angle is the angle between the leading edge here and the lateral axis of the aircraft, which would be about here. So this angle in here is your sweep angle. This is something you see very commonly on jet aircraft. The average cord is the average length of the cord along this whole length of the wing. To find the true average cord, you would need to add up all the possible cords along the length of this wing and divide by however many you have. So to actually find out the average cord is quite tricky. The aspect ratio is a ratio of the span of the wings to that average cord. Long, thin wings will have this high aspect ratio. We mentioned that finding the true length of the cord is actually quite tricky. So what you can do, and what is quite common, is you use the area of the wing. Because in theory, the area of the wing is equal to the span times the average cord. So by doing some rearranging, you can find out that the average cord is equal to the area divided by the span. You then substitute this in for the average cord, do a bit of maths, you end up with span over area over span. And then we don't like that on the bottom. So what you can do is you can multiply throughout by the span and end up with another formula for aspect ratio, which is span squared over area. So aspect ratio is either span over average cord or span squared over area. And high aspect ratio wings are very long and very thin. The MAC, or the mean aerodynamic cord, is derived from the mean aerodynamic wing. The mean aerodynamic wing is an equivalent wing that is perfectly rectangular, that has exactly the same properties as this swept back tapered wing. And then your average cord along that length is always the same because it's rectangular. And from there, you derive your MAC, or your mean aerodynamic cord. The rigging angle is the angle between the cord line of the wing and the longitudinal axis of the aircraft at the root of the aircraft. It's a measure of how the wing is mounted onto the aircraft. So in here you have your rigging angle. The angle of incidence is the angle between the cord line 
and the longitudinal axis of the aircraft. So at the root of the aircraft where it's mounted, that cord line is gonna be exactly in the same place. So we're gonna have the rigging angle equal to the angle of incidence here. So your angle of incidence or incidence angle is equal to your rigging angle at the root. As we travel towards the tip of the wing, the wings are often twisted, this property known as washout. This means that the angle of incidence is actually changed as you go out. So it starts off very steep, and then as you come down, the cord line will be shallowed off, the angle of incidence will be shallowed off. So that's where your difference comes between the rigging angle and the angle of incidence. At the root, they're the same, but along the length of the wing, the angle of incidence will be different from the rigging angle. The final property to talk about is dihedral and anhedral. This is very similar to the sweep angle in a way, because it is the angle between the lateral axis and the wing, but it's up the vertical axis rather than in the horizontal. So anhedral wings droop down from the aircraft and dihedral wings slope up from the aircraft. An easy way to remember the difference between the two, it's very cheesy, but if you die, you go up to heaven, hopefully. All right, definition's done. Now let's look at some designs. First of all, the best wing design produces the correct amount of lift for its circumstances with the least amount of drag. To reduce the drag, we want to reduce our wingtip vortices and our induced drag. And we also want to reduce our parasite drag in the form of skin friction and form. To reduce the form drag, we would mainly focus on the design of the fuselage of the aircraft and try to avoid any sharp angles and surfaces opposing the direction of travel. To reduce skin friction, we would make the skin nice and smooth and avoid as many bumps and roughness as we possibly can. And to reduce our induced drag and our wingtip vortices, we can do two things. The first thing is to increase our aspect ratio, which means either increasing the span or reducing the cord. Ideally, both. Let's look at the cord first. So, we know from the previous class that a shorter cord length will disturb the particles for less amount of time, and that pressure differential on the top will be a much smaller area, meaning that the strength of the wingtip vortices are weaker. So we want a low cord length. It also means that we try and increase our wing span. This leads to a more gradual pressure flow gradient and means that our trailing edge vortices are actually weaker. With weaker trailing edge vortices means that our downwash is less. So we get a low downwash here and we get high downwash over here, which means that our effective airflow is angled less and our induced angle of attack, which would come in here, and we remember the forces act 90 degrees to this. Reaction forces acting 90 degrees to that induced angle of attack. It means that our lift force is a greater proportion of that reaction force because the reaction force is angled less back than in the case of downwash being higher. In essence, we want a high span and a low cord. The downside of having a high span, low cord wing is the shape needs a lot of supporting structurally because it's very long and thin. The structure inside therefore needs to be quite strong, making it hard to incorporate wing fuel tanks, which is the common place to store fuel in an aircraft. At high speeds, the induced drag becomes a much more small component of our total drag. This is what we'll cover in the next class, but just know for now that at high speeds, the induced drag is less important than the parasite drag. So when you're traveling at a high speed, the benefit of this design is not felt as much. So with a high aspect ratio, we're looking to primarily fly slowly and we don't really need the fuel in the wings.
This is why gliders have that high aspect ratio wing. The other thing to do to reduce vortex induced drag is to try and create a lift profile along the length of the wing where there's a large amount of the wing root and a tiny amount of the wing tip, ideally zero. This means that there's no pressure differential at the wing tip and that means that there is no wing tip vortex produced. This is what is known as an elliptical lift distribution and if you look at it graphically you will see this sort of picture. You have a consistent coefficient of lift the whole way along without it ever dropping off. So due to the slowly changing nature of the cord length as we go from root to tip, the trailing edge vortices are changing constantly to scale with these cord lengths, meaning that the downwash and the effective angle of attack is constant across the whole wing. This means that the lift produced per unit area of the wing is consistent, or the coefficient of lift is constant. Wings do have to end at some point though, so a sharp drop off in coefficient of lift is experienced where the wing ends. Although the pressure differential is small, creating a small vortex. The engineering required behind an elliptical wing design is really complex and it makes them very rarely seen today. The next design choice is a rectangular wing. So the benefits from a large long area of cord length produce a large amount of lift or a high coefficient of lift. The wing however does not round off to a point as the elliptical one does which means there's still a large amount of lift produced at the tips which leads to a large vortex which in turn leads to more downwash, larger induced angles of attack and a steeper reactive force, it's more angled back the way and that means more of that force is made up of drag and less of lift. The lift distribution looks something like this. You get a high amount of lift and it drops off suddenly. The next design choice is a tapered wing. By tapering the wing, we reduce the overall area providing lift, but we can reduce the downwash in the mid wing section and we can increase it over the wing route due to that longer cord. The downwash does increase though as a result of the larger wing tip vortices caused by that greater pressure gradient between the tip and root and that more severe span wise flow. So what you can see is an overall less amount of lift produced, but it is more consistent along the length before suddenly dropping off. So the next design choice is incorporating a taper and a sweep back into the wing. By tapering past about 0.5 taper ratio and sweeping the wing, the downwash increases significantly at the wing root and reduces close to the wing tip. That is until reaching the end of the wing where the downwash is greatest due to the wing tip vortex. This creates a quite weird looking coefficient of lift graph like this. So at the wing root, the downwash is greatest, meaning our reactive force is angled back the most. It then slowly reduces and then rapidly drops off, meaning we get a lot of lift produced. And then right at the wing tip where that vortex is, the downwash is greatest and it drops back off suddenly. So you get this weird looking graph with a bump. Adding winglets or something similar such as wing tip fuel tanks creates a barrier between the bottom and the top surfaces, not actually allowing the air to flow. So if you look at it in sort of the 3D space, you would find the wing tip, the air tries to correct and it hits this surface. It's unable to go the full way around. So it means that the strength of these wing tip forces are actually weaker when compared to an aircraft without winglets. This difference is very significant and it's often why you see lots of winglets on low cost carriers, um, you know, your Ryanairs and your EasyJets because they're trying to save as much fuel as possible and try to minimize drag as much as possible is a good way to do that, hence the winglets. Another tool to use by wing designers is the wing camber can be changed along the length of the wing. Most commonly the camber is reduced at the wing tips when compared to the wing root and this reduces the pressure differential caused between the top and bottom surfaces and therefore the wing tip vortex is a bit weaker. 
As we can see, downwash in all of these designs is the key factor in controlling our induced airflow and our induced angle of attack and how much that reaction force is angled backwards. So designers often incorporate this twisting towards the wing tip or washout, which reduces the angle between the cord line and the effective airflow towards the wing tip artificially. So you see at the wing tip, you reduce the induced angle attack by angling the wing forward and a greater proportion of our reaction force is vertical rather than horizontal when compared to the wing route. So for any aspect ratio that you have, the most efficient wing is the one with the perfectly elliptical design to achieve that perfectly elliptical lift distribution. However, due to the engineering challenges with elliptical wings, it's not widely used today. And you can tell just by looking at a jet airliner that sweep back taper designs are much more favorable. This is because this is a compromise between all these designs to best suit the job that it needs to. So to summarize, the best wing design produces the correct amount of lift for the least amount of drag. So to reduce our form drag, we avoid sharp angles. To reduce our skin friction drag, we make everything smooth. And to reduce our induced drag, we reduce our vortexes or vortices. We reduce our vortices. How do we reduce our vortices? Well, first, we increase the aspect ratio, which means we increase our span or we reduce our cord length. We can also aim for an elliptical lift distribution across the length of the wing. So it comes down slowly, slowly, slowly towards the tip where there's almost zero lift produced. This is because the downwash is consistent and the induced angle of attack is consistent and in scale to the cord length, making that low differential pressure towards the wing tip. So our common wing designs will give us lift distribution patterns like this. So this is the elliptical wing, produces fairly consistent until reaching the end where it drops off. This is the most efficient wing design, but it comes with the challenges of being very hard to engineer and expensive. The next you get is a rectangular wing design, which produces a bit more lift, but it drops off towards the tip. The next you can get is a sweep back, which actually has a lower amount of coefficient of lift produced, but it creates a more even picture along the length of the span. And the final is a combination of sweep back and taper, which produces a funky design where it starts off low, increases very greatly, and then drops off rapidly. These designs can then be enhanced further by changing the camber of the wing, and also by adding a washout. So the camber means that we produce less lift at the tips, which means that our pressure differential is reduced and our vortex strength is reduced. Downwash is reduced. That means our induced angle of attack is lower. And that means our force is angled backwards by a lesser proportion and it is more angled up the way, which means more of that reactive force is lift. Washout is an artificial reducing of that induced angle of attack. So where the downforce is the greatest, AKA at the wing tips, we reduce the induced angle of attack artificially. 